My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, all praise and gratitude is for the sake of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. We seek His help and forgiveness from the evil of our souls and from the sins that we have committed. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send His peace and blessings on our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family, his companions, and all of his righteous followers till the Day of Judgment. May Allah make us of those righteous followers. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. I bear witness that there is no one worthy of worship except for Allah and He has no partners in His worship and that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is His final messenger and His slave. May Allah make us of His true slaves. Ameen. O you who believe, fear Allah as He should be feared and die not except in a state of submission, in a state of Islam. May Allah make us of those who leave this world in a complete state of submission to Allah. Ameen. O mankind, be dutiful to your Lord who created you from a single person, Adam, and from him he created his wife Hawa, and from them both he created many men and women. And fear Allah, to whom you demand your mutual rights, and do not cut the relationships of the wombs. Surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala watches everything that you do. O you who believe, keep your duty to Allah and fear him, and always speak the truth. Indeed, the best of speech is the speech of Allah, which is the Qur'an al-Kareem, and the best of guidance is the beloved sunnah of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and the worst of matters are those that are innovated on a religion as an act of ibadah, as an act of worship, which is not from the Quran and Sunnah. And anything of that sort is a bidah. Anything that's bidah is gone astray. Anything that's gone astray will be in the hellfire. May Allah protect us from the hellfire. Ameen. My brothers and sisters, I wanted to start off with a statement that a lot of people ask that why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? And the answer is simple, as the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ clarifies it. The answer is bad things do not happen to good people. It's just the way we look at things and the way we understand the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala behind it and the fact the way we respond to the difficulties is what makes us successful or unsuccessful. As the hadith mentions that how amazing is the affair of the believer that whenever something bad happens to them, they're patient and whenever something good happens to them, they are grateful for it and that is only for the believers. And so it's about our attitude, it's the way we look at life. So I wanted to start and dedicate the first part of the khutbah today to the month of winter. And to understand that this, you know, every time winter hits, this is me personally. Somebody asked me at work, what is the, uh, you know, you have, because I just got hired in, alhamdulillah. Uh, and they asked uh, us to do an activity and they said, what is the one winter activity you love to do? That was the question. And my, my answer was, I love to get out of the winter and go to a warmer area. All right? It's just as winter comes, we typically connect this to a very lazy time in our lives, uh, less productivity and everyone feels that, you know, we just got to get through this. But subhanAllah, everything in Islam is an opportunity. And even in winter, it is amazing how the Sahaba and the Prophet ﷺ looked at it. And this is true for any aspect of our life. So I'm going to start with the uh, statement of Ibn Mas'ud, one of the greatest scholars of Islam, a great companion of the Prophet ﷺ. This is his statement, and he used to say that, Marhaba, you know, welcome to winter. Uh, blessings come down in the, in the nights and for, for standing in the night prayer and in the days because they are long we can fast. So the way he looked at it is this is the only opportunity you will get in the rest of the year where you have very long nights where you can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than a typically that you'll be able to do and you can fast very easily and start establishing new sunnahs that, that we know about that we are not able to fulfill because of the days being longer but right now subhanAllah if you start fasting uh, literally, if you skip lunch, you'll be able to get through the day very quickly and before you know it, it's time to break your fast. So this is how they looked at winter. And the Prophet also mentioned a couple of things which are also very specific to winter to give us that boost and motivation that you would only get this reward in these type of situations. We know when we turn, you know, I have a tenant, they just messaged me this, they were complaining that when I turn on the tap, the water is not warm for more than five minutes. It starts getting colder and after some investigation realized that he's pretty much taking long showers and running the whole hot water out of the tank and then obviously left with you know not much hot water to go with so people literally spend hours in some literally half hour to 45 minutes in the showers just you know doing whatever uh, just letting the warm water run by and sometimes we don't realize just turning on that tap and getting that hot water we need to be thankful because most of the world doesn't have that ability and so the Prophet ﷺ told us, Shall I tell you that which Allah will wipe out your sins? And the first thing he mentioned, and the, messen and the companion said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, please tell us. So always be ready when you hear these ahadith to implement them, to be excited to implement them, not to just hear them for, for purpose of information only. So he said, performing wudu when it is difficult. Any difficulty you feel in the month of winter because you have to go for wudu, and let's be honest, a lot of people who are lazy to pray, are actually lazy to make wudu. Once you make wudu, there are other ahadith that clearly indicates that 
you are step, you know, taking, making sure that this is one of the measures to take the shaitan away. And once you start making wudu, just like the Apostle mentioned, the person who does not put any effort to wake up for fajr, then at night time, the shaitan, he ties three knots behind his back. And when he wakes up and he makes his first dua, one of the knots is removed. Then he makes wudu, the second knot is removed. And then he says, Allahu Akbar and goes in prayer. Then the third, third knot is removed. So making wudu is one of the great ways and that's why Bilal radiallahu anhu, we know that the Prophet sallallahu he heard his footsteps in Jannah and he asked what is it that made you uh, get that type of status and he said that it is that whenever he breaks his wudu, he, he makes his wudu immediately. So making wudu itself is an amazing act and it is a way to repel, to repel shaitan. And when you're in a state of wudu, you're in a special protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But especially when times are difficult, you're getting that extra reward. On top of that, the Prophet also mentioned to take many steps to the masjid. Taking steps to the masjid is also difficult. Everyone wants to get the closest spot possible so they don't, they don't have to walk in the cold weather. But remember this hadith, every extra step that you're taking, you are getting that extra good deeds. And this last part is also very much possible only in the months of winter. And that is to wait from one salah to the next salah. It is as if you're worshipping Allah the whole time you're just sitting at the masjid waiting for the next prayer to start you're getting rewarded as if you're in worship the whole time and if you think about it the time between Asr and Maghrib it is so short that we can make that as a part of our routine maybe try that once a week just come in at the masjid you know settle down after Asr and just wait till Maghrib, uh, Maghrib that's about an hour and you are able to also implement this hadith so subhanAllah, there's so many opportunities that only the month of winter allows us to benefit from. And what is amazing is Ibn Rajab comments about this hadith that Umar anhu, when he's passing away, and we've all faced people who are passing away, even right now there's du'as for people who are sick, and how many of us have experienced death. When we're dying, what's the things that are going to be running through our mind? The investments and who's going to take the inheritance and all of the things that, that are occupying our mind. But Umar anhu, this is his advice to his son Abdullah ibn Umar anhu. He said that making wudu in the days of winter is one of the characteristics of the iman, of, of a true belief. SubhanAllah, what an opportunity. And that is what Islam is all about. Every difficulty has an opportunity in it. Only someone who's pessimistic and who does not see it will see it as a punishment. But every, every hardship has some ability to turn it into an opportunity. And that is the life of the Prophet Sallallahu can you think of a year where you could say that this was a smooth year for the Prophet? A whole life of difficulty, but he was successful because he turned all of those difficulties into opportunities. The next thing I want to talk about is a couple other things about regarding winter. And like I already mentioned, the standing up at night uh, for uh, tahajjud. This is very much possible. And even for those who want their eight to nine hours of sleep, which is not something you really need to have a productive lifestyle. But even for those who want that, even with that, you'll have four or five hours to work with. Aisha comes in around 6.30 p.m. Fajr is at 6.30 a.m. That's a whole 12 hour night. How is it possible that we still are not able to get up and do those couple of extra rakahs for the Hajjid? Something that we have already heard khutbs about, about the great deeds of, a great deed of the Hajjid. And we probably felt that this is a check, this is an X for me, this is not gonna happen. But SubhanAllah, with the 12 hour night to work with, if you simply wake up 20 minutes before Fajr, you will still have a very good night of sleep and you can wake up for the Hajjid. May Allah make us of those who implement that. Ameen. For, for fasting, like I said, and in the second part of the khutbah, we'll also talk about the generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and two of his names, a Shakir and a Shakur, which is something that I want everyone to remember in, this, in these difficult uh, days, uh, in whatever difficulty we're facing, to remember the names of Allah, a Shakir and a Shakur. And one of the things about those names is that whatever little that you do, Allah multiplies it in ways you can't imagine. No human being will be able to reward you the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards you. So I wanted to end this first the part of the khutbah with a dua that inshallah I'll be sharing tonight. Uh, in, in fact, we'll be covering the inner dimensions of our prayer from uh, to, ab to be able to help us focus in our prayer. That's something that I'm doing tonight, inshallah, at 8 o'clock after Isha. Uh, highly encourage everyone to attend. But this is one of the du'as that I picked up upon because it's connected to the cold weather so that we can also make an uh, action item for us to memorize this du'a and start reading it in our daily prayer. For the Desi community, typically, uh, this is just my experience. After you say Allahu Akbar in your prayer, the typical dua that we say is Subhanakallahumma bihamdik wa tabarakasmuk wa ta'ala jadduka wa la ilaha illa ghayruk. I was never told that there's other duas. You can simply pick up Husnul Muslim and see all the authentic duas in different positions of the prayer. 
And this is one of those du'as that if you start memorizing it, it is a great opportunity to amplify the, the experience of your prayer. Because sometimes we're just making the same exact repetition of du'as, same exact surahs, and we don't feel any passion in our prayer. So this du'a specifically we'll be covering tonight as well, is right after you say Allahu Akbar, you can make this as one of the optional du'as, which is Allahumma ba'id bayni wa bayni khataya ya kama ba'adta bayna al-mashriqi wal-maghrib Allahumma naqini min al-khataya kama ya naqad kama ya naqad thawbad abyad min al-danas Allahumma ghsil al-khataya ya bil-ma'i wa thalji wal-bard O Allah, distance me from my sins like you have created the distance between the west, east and the west so immediately you notice that the power of this dua is a lot of people who don't pray is they have created a barrier in their minds that I am too sinful, I am too dirty, my sins are so much that I am not worthy to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This dua defies, this dua cancels out any of that type of thinking. And the person is saying, oh Allah, separate me and put a barrier between me and my sins just like you have created the distance between the east and the west. Allahumma naqini min al-khataya kama yunaqqal thawbad abiyad min al-danas. Oh Allah, purify me, my sins, like you do with when there's a white garment and you purify and you cleanse the filth from white garment. Specifically mentioning the white garment because we know that if you are looking good and one bad coffee stain and a white garment, it just ruins your whole day. And so just like you wash away any filth that comes with a white garment, you're trying to have a pure life as a Muslim, oh Allah, remove that from me. And the last part is when it gets interesting and Allah, the Prophet specifically mentioned, oh Allah, wash away my sins with water, snow and hail. He mentioned snow and hail and I can't imagine in the desert the Prophet ﷺ having to experience snow. So then why did he mention these cold items? And that is the beauty of these du'as, they are very uh, full of meaning. So when you commit a sin, there's a burning effect to the sins, there's a guilt, there's something that bothers you. And so what the Prophet ﷺ is saying is, I want that guilt to be cleansed, I want that sin to be washed away, but also that pain to be relieved with coolness with coolness of Iman, with coolness of forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he specifically mentioned for that after effect of the sin to be washed away with hail, with water, and with snow. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to implement these things that we've learned. Aqulun qali hadha wa astaghfirullah lakum inna huwa al ghafurur rahim. Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een So my brothers and sisters, we've given some action items. You can start with the intention of fasting, Mondays and Thursdays. That's something that you can simply make the intention inshallah. And even if you're not able to, Allah will still give you the reward for that intention. You can also start to try to add maybe once a day, or once a week, twice a week, whatever you can to wake up a couple of uh, 20 minutes, 10 minutes before Fajr and try to add those two rakahs. We also uh, give an action item of trying to memorize this dua and amplify the meaning of your prayer on a daily basis. And I'd like to end the winter topic by also reminding us that there is a great reward of relieving the stress that dif and difficulty that winter brings to people who are less fortunate than us. In a beautiful story then, uh, with Safwan ibn Salim, radiallahu anhu, there is um, is a, uh, a story where in Medina it gets cold and alhamdulillah I just came back from Umrah and I didn't, I didn't realize that yes it does get cold over there. Uh, so subhanAllah on a cold day he saw a man on the outskirts of the Masjid al-Nabawi and he noticed that he is you know feeling the effects of cold and he's not wearing a lot of warm clothes and so he took his extra garment and he clothed his brother with that garment. A bro another person in Syria in a whole different part of the land sees a dream of Safwan entering paradise because of that cloth. So he makes a trip to Medina and he narrates the dream to Safwan and he gives him the good news. So this is simply him taking the extra gar garment that he had and feeling the pain of his brothers and sisters. So a lot of times we hear fundraisers and sometimes we feel that it's just getting too repetitive but understand that there's so much need out there that we could spend all throughout our life and still not be able to fulfill the needs of the people out there. So we ask Allah first of all to relieve them of their stress and those difficulties and to make us a way for relief for those people. Ameen. The last part of the khutbah, brothers and sisters, I want to focus on the names of Allah, Ashakir and Ashakur. So, loosely translated in English, it is the one who is grateful. 
But then we have to ask ourselves the question, what does Allah have to be grateful for? Why would, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be calling himself a shakin and a shakur? Shouldn't we be the ones that are supposed to be grateful to Allah? When Allah gave us everything and he's giving himself these two names, the one who's grateful. In fact, shakin and a shakur should be translated with more of the concept of ziyada, increase. So shakin and a shakur is someone with the very little effort that you put in, he amplifies the reward of it in ways you can't even imagine. And in this beautiful hadith in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, None of you gives charity for, from what is good, for Allah only accepts what is good, but that the merciful takes it with his own right hand. Even if it's, in, it's a date, it is nurtured in the hand of the, of the merciful, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, until it becomes greater than a mountain, just as one of you nurtures his young horse or a camel. So you spend $10 and Allah nurtures it and amplifies the reward of it until it turns into mountains of good deeds. And this also goes perfectly with the next hadith, which is Hanallah life-changing. I shared this with some of the youth. And before I share this hadith with you, the story behind it is one of our shiuch, he, and he did this with uh, different uh, Islamic schools where understand that these are Muslim children who are supposed to know Allah better than a typical person outside of an Islamic school. And so they were asked, how many of you think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is angry with you? And that he is mad because you are, you are committing sins and that he is ready to punish people. And most of the people in the Islamic school, most of the kids, they raise their hand. And that is their concept of Allah, the one who is ready to punish. The moment you commit a sin. And how many, how many people just cannot get beyond judging other people because of their sins and we're ready to attack. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave himself two names, a shakir and a shakur to show that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for him, anytime you make an effort to come to him, you will find him running to you. And so to understand this formula, because these kids must not know this hadith, otherwise they would have never said that about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's look at this hadith narrated by Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. He mentioned verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the Prophet sallallahu mentioned, that verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has recorded good and bad deeds and he has made those clear. What is good and what is bad is very clear. Whoever intends to perform a good deed, and he is not able to do it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him a good deed. Even if you don't end up doing it, just like I said, make the intention for the things I mentioned in the first part of the khutbah, even if you don't end up doing it, Allah gives you the good deed for it. Now, let's, let's, let's say the person does make the intention to do a good deed and he ends up doing that action, he gets at the minimum 10 good deeds. Most of the youth I asked last yesterday or a couple of days ago, they said double the reward. But subhanAllah, Allah is saying no, minimum you're gonna get is 10 times the reward for whatever action that you do. But it doesn't end there. And then the Prophet said it could be multiplied up to 700 times and then even more than that. Every time you do a good deed, that is the formula. It's a multiplication factor. Now let's come to the bad deeds. When you intend to do a bad deed, but because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's fear, because you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you hold yourself back. How many times we felt that we missed out? You wanted to go to a certain gathering, you wanted to go to uh, you, in, a, in a certain investment and you knew that this is not something that would please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you held yourself back and then you felt as if you missed out. Remember the fact that the fact that you held yourself back, Allah gave you the reward for it. Now if you do end up committing that bad deed, you made the intention and you end up committing the bad deed, you only get one bad deed in your record. So when you do a good, it's multiplied. When you do bad, it's only a, a single factor. So uh, Ibn Mas'ud who commented, how can a person possibly fail when Allah has created the system of this type? And then how can a Muslim in an Islamic school say that Allah is ready to punish me and that's all they know of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How merciful is Allah and how much we don't know about him? And that fact that he himself calls him a shakin and a shakur, the one who's grateful, then shouldn't we be grateful? And I want to end with a couple of ahadith that clarify this concept that anytime you do good deed, you know, sometimes we are still struggling to say salams to each other. You know, this person didn't say salam, why should I say salam back? But remember the multiplication factor. Everything we do is for our own benefit. The Prophet also mentioned, Man salla ala wahidatan sallallahu alayhi ashra, whoever sends blessing upon me once will, will have Allah send blessing upon him ten times. Sometimes we say sallallahu alayhi wasallam and you know a lot of times you don't hear the sallallahu alayhi wasallam but every time you say that you get good ten good deeds. So Imran ibn Hussein reported that a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Assalamu alaikum. So the Prophet ﷺ responded, Ashrun. He just got 10 good deeds. Then another man came and he said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And the Prophet said, Ashrun, 20 good deeds. And then another man came in and he said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
notice these, guys, these people are not waiting for the next person to say salam and get the smile. They're doing it purely for the sake of Allah. And the Prophet said, Salathun, the, this person just got 30 good deeds. Just for saying salams, smiling in the brother's face. We've all heard of these things, but remember the formula as well that we mentioned earlier. Everything is multiplied by 10. If you say Alif Lam Meem, if you're reciting the Quran and you're struggling, just read one line of the Quran if that's all you can do, but do something on a daily basis and you get 30 good deeds just for saying Alif Lam Meem. As the Prophet clarified, every letter has 10 good deeds. And it is consistent throughout our sun the Sunnah of the Prophet how great uh, our Lord is. How many of us have applied for universities? I myself am a professor and I've had people who plead for me to pass them when they failed an exam. And the best I could do is maybe bump them up by one grade, maximum a grade, and maybe if, if they got if one person got a D, I gave them up to C plus. You know, B minus would be pushing it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the minimum is giving you 10 good deeds. Even if, if your effort is weak and it doesn't deserve Jannah, Allah will multiply it, subhanAllah. If a person has two kids and one of them is able to memorize the Quran really well and the other is dif having difficulties, just because that second child has the intention to, uh, to have the whole Quran memorized and he's not able to do it in his lifetime, when he is resurrected on the Day of Judgment, he will be given the reward as if he memorized the whole Quran. Us as parents, we might be so much more difficult on our kids because we, don't, we start comparing the kids, but inside of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that other child is all, all, also going to get the same reward because he put his effort, he or she put their effort, but they couldn't get to the end line, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extrapolates it and gets you there regardless even if you weren't able to get there. That is the formula that we're living by. How can we possibly fail? And that is why the Prophet ﷺ said, the only person who will end up in the hellfire is the one who refuses. They want to end up in the hellfire. If a, if a non-Muslim wants to accept Islam, what is the first thing they immediately get? A fresh slate. Ask those who have a criminal record how that stays with you till the end of your life. No, no human being wants to forget about it. Nobody wants to, you know, the, the system does not want to forgive you. They will keep bringing it up every time you do a credit check, any time in your life, they will remind you of that crime. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wipes out your sins. Nine, a person kills 99 people. This is a, an authentic hadith, this actually happened. And then he kills a hundred person and he still is forgiven. A person who's a prostitute lives his, her life, whole life, disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they feed an, a thirsty dog and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them Jannah. That's Allah's way of forgiving and that's the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works. There should be no one who fails this test. Only the people who end up in the hellfire. That should also answer the question sometimes shaitan puts in our mind. You know, my, 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 uh, my co-workers, these people are so nice and they're good people, then why did they end up in the hellfire? First of all, we don't know that. And secondly, if they were to simply accept Islam, look at the way Allah starts them off. All of their sins are washed away as if they are just born. Opportunity after opportunity. It's only the person who refuses and does not want to accept this gift ends up in the hellfire. May Allah protect us from the hellfire. I mean, my brothers and sisters, inshallah, once again, I remind you to come tonight at 8 o'clock. We also have uh, another event that we're trying to bring uh, with Sheikh Hasa Birgis, uh, which is um, about uh, marriage and something. And, and this particular community had requested from Al Maghrib Institute to bring that program. That's also coming on February 12th. We'll talk more about that tonight as well. But I'll end with this ayah which was an eye-opener for me. I just told you about the names of Allah, Shakir and Shakur, the one who appreciates. And in Umrah, when you go between Safa and Marwa, they have billboards where you recite this ayah every time. You go from Safa and Marwa. And this is talking about a woman, when she was running between Safa and Marwa and her child is at the brinks of dying, she kept on running because she wanted to do her part. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was watching and He is aware and He was appreciating it. And he mentioned exactly those two names at the end of this ayah. And that was an eye opener. When I was reflecting upon the names of Shakin and Shakur, and then you go to Safa and Marwa, and you recite this ayah, and at the end is exactly the same two names. How perfect is the Quran, subhanAllah. Allah says, Inna Safa wal Marwa, min sha'airillah, fa man hajj al bayta, awa tamara fala junaha alayhi, an yatawa fa bihima, wa man tatawa khairan fa inna laha shakirun alim. Indeed, a Safa and Marwa are among the symbols of Allah. So whoever makes Hajj to the house and performs Umrah, may Allah make us of those who are able to, Amin. There is no blame upon him for walking between them. And whoever volunteers good, then indeed Allah is a Shakir. Allah is the one who appreciates. And he is Alim, who is the one who is well-knowing of what you do.